Thank you very much for being on the programme uh, this morning. So last July, Rishi Sunak laid out a 10-point plan to tackle illegal migration. How's that going? Well, we've made a lot of progress in a short period of time. We've already entered into really unique landmark deals with France, which are seeing a big increase in the number of interceptions on the beaches. 33,000 migrants were stopped crossing as a result of that last year, a 40% increase on the year before. We've entered into a gold standard arrangement with Albania that is seeing thousands of Albanian legal migrants returned home and the numbers crossing from that country significantly reducing. We've just entered into an agreement with Georgia. We've entered into one with Italy. And on the domestic front, we've increased the amount of illegal working visits, like raids on car washes and nail bars and so on, by 50% this year alone, all to make it harder to operate in the UK if you're either an illegal migrant or one of the people smuggling gangs. And just this week, I've been in North Africa, in countries like Tunisia and Algeria, taking the fight to the people smuggling gangs upstream before people have even got close to the UK. Okay. We're increasing the resources of our National Crime Agency through Operation Invigor so that they have the resources to smash the gangs and organised immigration crime. So on every front, we're taking action and we're starting to see the results of that in the numbers crossing the channel. I want to unpick some of what you said uh, a little later in the interview just to try and work out you know, exactly the progress that is being made. But first, you recently said in a speech that people who arrive in the UK on small boats are cannibalising our communities. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I didn't say that. What I said was that they risk cannibalising the compassion of the UK public because what we're seeing with the small boats is a very large number of mostly young men leaving safe countries like France, often having passed through multiple safe countries, coming to the UK and then requiring immense resource what, 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 here to accommodate, to support and to integrate them. What do you um, mean by the word cannibalising, though? Why, why did you choose that word? It's a very eye-catching word. Well, what I think it's the, right, it's the right terminology that the illegal migration challenge, the small boats crisis, is making it harder for the UK to do what we really want, which is to support people who are genuinely seeking the support you're saying of the United Kingdom. You're something a bit different Kingdom. there. You're saying it's making it harder for the UK to do what they want, but you use the word cannibalising. What, what did you mean by cannibalising? Because with small boats, you're finding that tens of thousands of young men who are in a place of safety, who are predominantly economic migrants, are coming to the UK, putting overwhelming pressure on our asylum system, and on the compassion and generosity of the British public and making it then harder for us to support people who genuinely need our help. And what we want to do as a government is devote our finite resources to helping families and those people who are in conflict zones by continuing to do world-class resettlement schemes like Homes for Ukraine, the Syrian and Afghan scheme, by doing our global scheme that works with the United Nations to take people out of refugee camps Are and bring you... them in a controlled manner to the UK. If you allow uncontrolled, illegal migration to escalate, then I'm afraid the British public will find it harder to support people who genuinely need our help. And that is why we're taking the very robust steps that we are okay. to get this problem under control. So let's see how you are getting the problem under control. What's the current backlog for asylum claim processing? Well, there's over 150,000 cases in the backlog, but we've made a very clear pledge to eliminate the legacy backlog over the course of this year. We made that pledge at the end of last year, and the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, and I put in place a robust plan, which is now working. You say and it's we're now working. The let's, let's, number of cases in the legacy fall. Let's have a look. You know, asylum applications are waiting a decision. Like you're talking about legacy there, most people just look at the overall cases. It might be one thing that you're starting to bring the legacy down, but if the overall numbers are going up, that's different. You can see there's been a small fall between 2022 well, well, and 2023. Let me, let me just, but let me I think just most people would look at this and not think that this is a system that's under control. Do you accept that? Uh, I think the system needs robust reform, and that's exactly what we're setting out to do. We are putting in place processes to streamline the way decisions are taken, to simplify, remove all of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. that has crept up in recent years, to double the number of caseworkers making the decisions 
over the course of this year. And that is beginning to have results, as you can see on the screen. And I'm confident that we will eliminate the legacy backlog. But the key thing to note here is that the sustainable answer to this challenge is to reduce the number of people crossing in the first place. I've just been to a number of European countries. Just They've all come got back. backlogs if, of cases. If, 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 but the, the way to stop this problem okay. is not to focus solely on the symptoms okay. of it, but is to focus on the cause. And that's why if we're I pursuing may, the bill that we're taking through Parliament today. If, if I may, um, the backlog is one element of this. Another element is the number of people who have been removed from the UK. Mm. Um, 38,000 failed asylum seekers and foreign criminals removed from the UK last year. That's the lowest number on record other than the pandemic years. Well, if you look at the stats for the beginning of this year, which is the period after the Prime Minister, Home Secretary and I put in place our plan, we're actually seeing returns back to pre-pandemic levels and we want them to rise. We've signed an agreement with Albania, which is absolute best in class. We've signed now one now with Georgia. Let's talk, let's talk about Albania uh, uh, then, uh, shall we? Because, as you say, so many people... Uh, it, it did make up quite a large proportion mm. of people arriving on small boats. So how many... You made a big play of the returns agreement you struck with Albania. So how many people who've arrived on small boats have been returned to Albania? Uh, well, thousands of Albanians are returning to Albania. It, it, I, just want to, I just want to split that because I know that foreign criminals are part of these numbers as well. Well, many of those have also arrived if we're just on talking small about, boats originally. If we're just talking about people arriving on small boats, how many have been uh, returned to Albania? Well, there are hundreds of Albanians who've arrived on small boats who have been placed on those flights as a result of the processes we put in place hundreds. and the agreement that we've reached with Albania. And you only have to look at what's how, happening... How, hundreds, uh, how many people but, but have arrived in Albania overall? If I just make this, this point, Sophie... And I, I'm just you, trying to get you, to you the only figures, you only have to look at what's, Well, if you only have to look at what's happening to the number of Albanians making this no, no, dangerous this is crossing... A different, this is a different point Well, it's not because the two are related. No, the I, reason I, I'm, that we're I'm returning Albanians is to deter people from coming I'm, in the first place, I'm, and that is succeeding. If I may, I'm specifically asking about the number of Albanians who have arrived on small boats who have been returned under the agreement. Because, to be completely honest with you, I'm trying to get to the bottom about whether you're trying to cloud these figures by focusing on foreign criminals who've been returned to Albania or whether this deal that you struck with Albania is actually working. Well, well the, the foreign offenders, in most cases, are being returned under the arrangement. Because what happens, and this is why we need to reform the system, is that even after serving a sentence in our prisons, an offender will then put in an asylum claim they may then also claim to be a victim of modern slavery. They make spurious last-minute uh, claims and appeals to frustrate our ability to remove them. And that's why we reached this agreement with Albania, I'm so still... that we can remove them. And, and just, still... and just, to, still... just to finish I'm, I'm the point, really... Sophie, okay. it is right that we focus on foreign national offenders. You know, of course we want to remove people who have come across on small boats, but we also should be getting people out of our prisons who have committed serious crimes sure. and returning them I don't home think, to Albania. I don't think it anyone would be wrong for the government to allow those people I don't think anyone's back disputing, into British society. I don't think anyone's disputing that. I'm just trying to work out how effective the Albania returns deal is. Of the number of Albanians who've arrived on small boats, how many have been returned under this gold standard, as you put it, agreement? Mm. Well, as I said, hundreds have been returned and that doesn't under seem... it. That but, many? Well, uh, what, it is what's a, happened to the rest of them? Well, it's, if you've got this it's, returns agreement, that means they can just click early, your fingers and get is, that. It was relatively early days. Have they just disappeared? It, it, it's relatively early days. But also, you only have to look at the numbers now attempting to cross the what's channel to the other, from Albania. What's happened to the other Albanians then? Are they in hotels or do you not know where they are? Uh, some of them are being accommodated. Some have returned home voluntarily. And some may well have absconded. But that, that is absolutely the reason why we're taking this action. So why, why are there still Albanians in got, hotels in the UK if you've well, got a gold are, standard there returns are, there agreement? Well, there are very few. We're working through those cases and removing them. But what, what you're getting to the nub of the question here, mm. which is that our system has become riddled with uh, legal processes which enable people to make spurious last-minute appeals. Even the Lord Chief Justice recently made this. Uh, point. That's why we're putting in place the Illegal Migration Bill that cuts all of this process out in the first place and is based on the very simple principle that if you come across in a small boat, you have no right to live or make a life in the UK. You'll either be returned home swiftly to a safe country like Albania or you'll be returned to a safe third country like Rwanda. And you won't be able to use our legal system or misuse our legal system 
in order to frustrate your removal. If we can okay. do that, we will break the people smuggling gangs, we will deter people from crossing in the first place. And, and with respect to Albania, you only have to compare the proportion of those people crossing the channel in the first quarter of last year to the first quarter of this year to see that this has been hugely okay. effective in creating the deterrent effect that we set out to. OK, let's talk about the COVID uh, inquiry, shall we? Um, the government's launched a legal challenge so it doesn't have to hand over unredacted WhatsApp messages to the COVID inquiry. What's it got to hide? We want to hand over to the COVID inquiry absolutely anything that has anything to do with COVID-19 or the purpose of the inquiry. And that's the right thing to do. This is an important inquiry and we want Lady Justice Hallett and her team to have access to all the information that they need. Where there is a point of difference is that we don't think that it's sensible or reasonable to hand over documents or messages that have nothing whatever to do with COVID-19. And I'm a former lawyer, I've been involved in discovery requests from courts in the past. And the normal way to do this is to set reasonable parameters to request anything that is related to the case, or in this situation, the inquiry, but not to ask for things that are wholly unrelated, nothing isn't whatever it, to do with the inquiry the to, to, to decide that? If you hand well, it over, not, then they can yeah, decide what's as relevant. A, as a that's lawyer, fair. having been involved in, in discovery in the past, that's not common practice. But it may not be common practice, but this is an exceptional set of circumstances, Well, I, I can't it? think of any situation where a court would ask for documents or messages that have absolutely nothing to do with the purpose of the case or the inquiry. I mean, for example, things to do with a civil servant or indeed a politician's private life it, that are wholly unrelated to the inquiry. But do you not trust inquiry. the inquiry to decide what's relevant? Well, it's not a question about whether we trust the inquiry or not. We have the highest regard for Lady Justice Hallett and her team. We're not asking for special treatment for the government. What we're saying is that we should uphold common legal practice, which would be applied in any civil case in the British courts and should be applied to this inquiry. We think that's very reasonable. I hope that this can be resolved indeed before it the matter even gets to court. And we want to continue to cooperate productively with okay. Lady Justice Hallett to resolve it. Boris Johnson, of course, bypassing the Cabinet Office to send his WhatsApps directly to the inquiry. Why do you think he's doing that? Well, it's, it's entirely up to the former Prime Minister how he cooperates with the inquiry. If he wishes to send his uh, documents or WhatsApp messages to them, then he's, he's at liberty to do so. I think a letter has been sent from the Cabin Office to him to say that as he is using taxpayers' funds to pay for his lawyers, then that funding has to be used for appropriate purposes. But he can advance whatever arguments he wants to and make whatever statements he wishes in his witness statement to the inquiry. I mean, There's absolutely some... no sense that the government will uh, restrict what uh, Boris Johnson wants to say. But if you use taxpayers' funds, obviously you should make sure you're using them appropriately. I mean, some would say that this comes down to the relationship between Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, maybe not the most helpful course of action for the former Prime Minister to take. Um, allies of Boris Johnson have told the Mail on Sunday that they think the num reason number 10 doesn't want to share the messages is because it could reveal Rishi Sunak's plotting to bring down Boris Johnson. No, as I say, the, the issue here is a simple legal one, which is, should you hand over material to an inquiry which has absolutely nothing to do with COVID-19? And that's a, a long-standing practice in British courts. I think it's fair and reasonable that that's applied to the inquiry as well. And I hope that we can resolve this with Lady Justice Hallett very soon. Now, you famously wrote a piece back in 2019 backing Boris Johnson. I think you have a look at it. Um, along with two faces who might be quite familiar to our viewers. You can sort of look in there. Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister, Oliver Dowd and the former Prime Minister. Do you regret backing Boris Johnson? No, it was the right decision at the time. The country was facing a very serious challenge. We needed to get Brexit done to end the paralysis that there was in Parliament at the time and to stop the Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, from taking over our country. So I'm sure all three of us fully support uh, that decision. But look, we have a great Prime Minister today in Rishi Sunak. He's getting on with okay. the challenges facing the country. And 
I fully support him. I mean, you all look a bit more fresh faced back then, I think, before the sort of political roller coaster <laughs> that we've all been on. Uh, Rishi Sunak's Prime Minister now, Oliver Dowden's Deputy Prime Minister. I mean, you keep backing the right horse, Boris Johnson, then Rishi Sunak. Are you a bit disappointed not to be Secretary of State? Look, I, it's entirely up to the Prime Minister who, who he appoints to which job. I'm, I've always taken on difficult and challenging roles. This is certainly one of them, but it's one that matters to the public. The public want to see us secure our borders to stop the boats, and that's what I'm working very hard with the Home Secretary, with the Prime Minister, to deliver.